Hello and welcome to this video. Today we'll be taking a look at the Gigabyte Ultra Durable HD3870. See if this durability is reflecting its performance nearly 10 years after its original release in 2008. The card sports 512MB of GDDR3 VRAM, an unusual variant seeing as most variants of this card supported GDDR4 for its VRAM. Another noticeable change is that her card has a lower TDP than other 3870 variants, due to its quality over quantity design, which meant using higher grade components, and the mob set features a lower RDS, which allowed it for a lot to consume lower amounts of power while still retaining the 770MHz core clock speed and memory clocks of 1125MHz. The interesting use of a Zalman cooler prevents the card from getting too hot, with the card topping out at 60 degrees while gaming. Very reminiscent of Zalman's low-profile CPU coolers, it can be evidently seen that this was the card you wanted to buy if you wanted minimal noise and temperatures. The card only requires one 6-pin power connector and features two DVI-I connectors and one S video output. The maximum power the card will consume is around the 100 watt mark. Now of course on with the benchmarks to see how this card can perform in 2017. First up we have Counter-Strike GO, a game that requires the utmost FPS to give you that competitive edge in gameplay. Playing the default settings of low at 720p gave us a return of 86 FPS on average over the course of an entire match. Staying well above 60 FPS for the most part and only ever dipping below this to a minimum of 49 FPS once during this, a flawless experience from this 10 year old card here. Turning up the resolution here would likely yield you similar FPS to that of our HD4890 we tested just a little while ago, however I'd recommend sticking to settings like these for that competitive edge in this game. Always an interesting result up next with Grand Theft Auto 5. Running the game in 800 by 600 resolution resulted in an average of 24 FPS. But the same with all older cards, the lack of driver support inhibits the card from performing to the fullest of its potential. The game ran smooth enough on foot, but was very much comparable to that of the Xbox 360 or PS3 variants of the game. However, driving was a completely different ballpark, with stutters and low FPS plaguing our GPU, due to how the quickly the card has to stream the high detailed environments with no optimised drivers to instruct it how to do so, and the clip was very much respective of that. Increasing the resolution to 1280 by 1024 made the game look much more appealing due to the enhanced resolution, and the performance it was virtually non-existent. This of course is a result of the poor driver support and thusly under-optimised graphics card in this game. Driving around less densely populated areas such as the airport gave a much more playable FPS. However, in an attempt to fly over the city, we saw the FPS crushed more so than driving, an experience that can be seen very much clearly in the benchmarks where heavy scenery and loading caused FPS to be just destroyed by the game. Not an unplayable game, but still lacking the optimised drivers, the game performed just about how I expected. Not terribly, but still not the most playable. Half-Life 2 looking and running great at the default 720p resolution with all settings at high, including HDR. The game hit an average of 97 FPS and only ever dipped below this to 77 FPS in the heat of action. The game was completely playable and you could go as far as turning the resolution up to 1080p or maybe even higher to 2K or 4K. This is of course until you hit the 512MB VRAM limit the card has in place. The card will take all Source games in its stride which Half-Life 2 clearly demonstrates here that the game was playable with more than enough FPS. Of course the Elder Scrolls 5 Skyrim up next with the card originally defaulting itself to the low preset, I thought it was being pushed enough, so I for medium settings with 2x anti-aliasing. Hitting 68fps on average with minimums of only 48fps, the card proved itself to be capable in a number of situations, ranging from caves to the wilderness to towns and cities. You can increase the resolution or maybe even up some settings if you want to add some eye candy, however this may cost you at the fps that we've got here. Crisis, the game that originally used to benchmark the graphics card upon its release. The card here achieves an admirable 35 FPS on average, with a mixture of medium and high settings. The resolution was 720p and the game looked as good as you'd expect it to. Gunfights, explosions and driving proved an easy feat for the card to handle with no visible slowdowns and the game did not stutter throughout our entire time playing. Something a little bit unusual up next, The Forest, a game that offers very similar visuals to that of Crisis 3 in my opinion, without the need for the DirectX 11 API which this graphics card does not support. Running the game at medium settings yielded us an average of 30 FPS, dipping down to 23 FPS in heavy action. Reducing settings would likely increase our FPS just a little bit more and this game is still an alpha development. Still a good effort for our 10 year old graphics card here. Finally, to conclude, Halo 2, a game that takes advantage of a lot of DirectX 10 features via its great use of part effects and such like. Hitting averages of 58 FPS and lows of only 37 FPS, the game looked and ran great, even at our high 1600x1200 resolution. 
Of course, the use of four times anti-aliasing didn't slow us down at all, and the 60 FPS Halo 2 experience is really something you must try. So to conclude, do I recommend this card? Well firstly, for its age, the card works straight out of the box. Going to prove that ultra durable technology Gigabyte has really might account for something. Secondly, it gave us playable FPS in the majority of games at 720p, making it ideal for modern gaming at lower resolutions. Some great stuff for a card that's a decade older than these titles. That Zalman cooler kept our card cool and quiet throughout all tests performed and was really something quite admirable considering it looks like it should be on a CPU, not a GPU. However, negatively, we've seen cards that cost less than this perform way better. £12 isn't bad price to performance, but still, it's not the best we've seen around the channel. The CPU fans, although great back in the day, did leave a little bit to be desired, as that CPU fan may need replacing, as I don't think it's covered by Gigabyte's ultra-durable standards. Driver support and lack of DX11 Plus support and newer APIs have rendered it obsolete in years and games to come. However, this isn't a major issue as I doubt it would have the power to run them anyway. Thank you very much for watching this video. Good night!